Hey, a pleasure to be here today. Uh, as Crystal mentioned, I was with the CET for, for seven years before moving across the water over to the, the survey. So uh, I've introduced these talks before. Um, normally I get to sit down around about now and just relax, so the pressure's on a little bit um, at today. Before I get started, I want to declare my allegiances. I, I'd have to say that even though I'm at the, the survey now and I'm using the, their banner, their striking um, colours, etc., 95% of this work was done at the CET over, over about uh, three or four years. I'd like to thank my, my co-authors, none of who are here today, uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge my, the financial support of the Geological Survey and also a number of companies. And these companies pretty much funded my, the fieldwork component of this project, whereas the, the survey kept that continuation going. So the objective today is quite straightforward. The objective is to try to constrain the source of fluids responsible for hypergene magnetite and hypergene hematite. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to focus in on one area, the World Range Greenstone Belt in Western Australia. I'm going to spend a third of the talk introducing the geology so that when we hit the, the fluid chemistry, everything is in its proper context. And then I'll wrap things up prov by providing a synthesis and hopefully addressing this question, where did these fluids come from? So in Western Australia, we're, we're lucky. We're lucky in terms of having large resources of, of iron ore. And it's also a playground for geologists like myself. We have great access to giant, world-class iron deposits. The largest ones are located in the Hammersley province, but we also have notable occurrences in the Pilbara Craton and the Yilgung Craton here. So these little dots are the, these occurrences. So in the Hammersley province, we have what we call superior type BIF, and these BIF are formed within a, a basinal setting, so they're surrounded by classic rocks typically. And in the Hammersley, they tend to be Paleoproterozoic in age. Whereas in the, the cratons, they are what we call algoma-type BIF. So they are bound within greenstone rocks. And they are a lot, they are, uh, marginally older, typically Archean in, in age. Looking at the Yilgun craton, here I show the occurrences of BIF in blue and their high-grade equivalents in, in iron. And what we call high grade depends on which country you're in, depends on the economic climate. Uh, in China, maybe this could be a lot lower. Uh, but here, for conventional reasons, we would say anything greater than 50% iron would be high grade. Now, the interesting thing of this map is that not all occurrences of BIF are enriched. So why, why is that? If iron enrichment is due to just weathering, then all these BIF are, are generally exposed. So why aren't they all our high-grade iron ore deposits? Even if we were to nosedive into the camp, not all BIF occurrences within the camp are, are mineralized. You can see railway tracks of, of BIF occurrences, and only uh, pods are mineralized. So why is that? And I think the answer is that we have hydrothermal upgrades of BIF. And we get something like this. Hydrothermal fluids, well, they can be hypergene, deeply sourced, or they can be supergene, near surface derived. Hypergene iron ore typically looks like this. And I have examples from the Yulgarn crash on here. Early stages are magnetite rich. This is a residual type of, of uh, magnetite ore. But they can also be veins of magnetite cutting through uh, thickly banded BIF. These types of mineralization predate specularite, and this is quite a spectacular uh, example from Kulinobin. And this is vein hosted. So these are hypergene ore, so a somewhat reduced fluids forming magnetite, a little bit more oxidized specularite, but deeply sourced. And throughout these deposits, they are generally overprinted by these supergene iron ore types, which are um, characterized by girthite uh, mostly. And here's a, a fragmental example. So the key feature of these deposits is that they are hybrids. They contain, at least in the Jorgen Kraton, they contain early stages of hypergene upgrades followed by the supergene enrichment. And in, at least in the Jorgen, you need both to form the high grade but the, 
the large tons of, of ore. If you don't have these components, you pretty much have a very small ore body. So the, the World Range Greenstone Belt is located in, in the Murchison Domain, and here's the, the plan view of it. This along strike is about 70 kilometers. So in these narrow blue lines, these are the BIF occurrences. Uh, the greenstone belt is pretty much defined by these greenish colours and the foot wall is located in the north and that is a felsic volcanic rock. The, the BIF is younger, overlying these felsic volcanic rocks and there are the, there's this Nanagurugu igneous complex which has an ultramafic, gabbro and dolerite expressions and the interpretation is that they have intruded the felsic volcanic rocks and inflated the sequence. So these BIF macro bands were, were separated through to these seals. And I see uh, many examples of, of intrusive behaviour between the, these dolerites and the, and the BIF. The stratigraphic hanging wall is located in the southern margin and contains felsic volcanic rocks and clastic rocks. And then there's a series of felsic intrusions which have intruded the greenstone uh, belt Belt at, at different stages, with the last episode is this uh, felsic intrusion up, up here, truncating the, the greenstone rocks. And the metamorphic um, conditions are a very low, low grade. So, vectoring in on this location here, the Beeman deposit and the Dung deposit, I'm going to be talking about these two uh, in, in detail today. Uh, the Beban deposit I, I mapped, this is about uh, eight kilometres along strike and there's BIF um, out, uh, cropping out and, and dolerite. Cross section through here you'd see something like this. So the BIF macro bands, that's about 80 metres thick, are separated by dolerite and, and they, the, the sequence has been folded and tilted. In these little dashed lines here are the high grade ore zones. And what you might see is that we have mineralization below this weathering front and above. So this is the unweathered high grade magnetite rich ore and then we see the, the near surface supergene modifi modification of that, of that rock. This is what the hypergene magnetite rich ore looks like and then some shear zone hosted specularite, hematite. Specularite is just coarse grain hematite. The ore body is about four kilometers in strike length shown by the high grade pods of, of iron and not by accident inverse relationship with silica. We need to remove the silica to form the high grade iron. What's interesting about Beban is that there's an outer zone of carbonate alteration. So over about, if this is uh, about 2 Ks, this is about 4 Ks. And it looks a little bit like this, the carbonate alteration. So in fresh rock, if we're looking at a plane 100 metres below the surface like here, and this is what we see in plan view, we can see the loss on ignition component is basically the carbonate alteration. So this is our alter, altera outer alteration halo, and then that's our inner alteration halo. At Madunga, it's located on the other margin of the, um, the greenstone belt, and it looks a bit like this over the same sort of scale with a BIF in the in the centre, surrounded by the Nanagurugu dolor, uh, dolorite and the foot wall felsic, felsic rocks. Cross section through, through here looks something like this with the foot wall felsic volcanic rocks, the younger BIF separated by volcanic classic rock and younger still sedimentary rocks containing massive sulphides. And there are intrusive relationships along these contacts, so the dolorite has intruded the, the BIF sequence. And here you can see the, the weathering front is a little bit deeper. This is the style of, of mineralization. So previously we had replacement style. This is kind of cool because it's a, a solid magnetite vein cutting across an otherwise banded silica rich BIF. And then there's a later style of mineralization which is specular, specularite, specular hematite which cuts along the banding there. So the ore body is, is there, looking at the geochem of 100 metres down, just like the other example, so we're around about, about here. So inverse relationship between the iron and the silica, and there's a loss on ignition. But 
During mapping and during my logging of, of drill core, I didn't see a speck of carbonate. So why is there this loss on ignition? I think it's because of girthite. We are not always above the weathering front. Sometimes it's a little bit lower along deformed contacts, so we're picking up some girthite here. So there's an obvious difference between Theban magnetite and Madunga magnetite, with, whereas the latter is vein related. So this is a, a nice slide which sort of summarizes the alteration which is happening at Beban, forming this residual type of magnetite ore. Starting on the left with a, a least altered BIF, you can see the thick bands of silica and the iron oxide bands. We go from here all the way through different alteration stages to a high grade magnetite ore, which is thinly banded, magnetite rich. And in fact, you can't really see the, the primary banding here. It's very weakly present but most of the magnetite is hypergene. It's secondary magnetite, which is crystallized. So how on earth did we get from here to there? Well, there's a lot of carbonate alteration, as I mentioned. So in this case here, carbonate has aggressively stripped out the, the silica from the BIF whilst keeping the primary texture. There's two different stages. The first one is siderite. You can tell by the coloration of the, the carbonate. And the second one is ferron dolomite. And then not only do we efficiently remove the silica, but then we have to remove the carbonate. So we've replaced one gain mineral by another, and now we need to actually have a volume reduction, dissolve the carbonate, and then we get a, a nice residual type high-grade ore. And that process is happening over four kilometers at, uh, at Beban. Four kilometers of carbonate alteration long strike, and then two kilometers worth of stripping out the carbonate. At Madunga, this is the vein style of magnetite mineralization. Starting with least salted BIF, there's weak hematite alteration to form a jasperlite, these jasper bands. But the key thing for mineralization is these veins. So here is a little fragment of the, the war rock, some talc alteration of the fringes, and then needles of hypergene magnetite intergrown with hypergene talc. And then on top, there is this uh, semi massive sulfide, four meters thick uh, at, at, um, at the top of the, the BIF, and locally occurring as veins cutting through, through here. So, quite complicated series of hypergene alteration steps. And I'm not talking about supergene, and I won't be talking about supergene until the very end of the talk. So, this is all about the hypergene alteration. So that was the two examples of the magnetite. Third is an example of specularite. It occurs at Beban and Madonga, so it occurs throughout the world range greenstone belt. This is what it looks like in hand specimen and in thin section. So what can you pick from this? Basically, we've introduced iron, but we've also mobilized silica. So obviously, this isn't really going to form super high-grade iron ore um, loads because of the contamination of, of silica and it's going to be very narrow. So they're only about five meter thick um, loads um, or shoots. And their timing is later than the magnetite. These veins uh, cut folded BIF and they cut the magnetite ore bodies. Examples of folding, just very quickly, you probably won't be able to see so, so well, but there are two different folding events affecting the, the world range and affecting the ore bodies. So that's why I mentioned it here. There's a little fold hinge in here, which has then been refolded by this second upright folding event, which tilted the greenstones. Uh, Martin van Kronendonk, uh, mapping through this air with uh, Tim Ivenich at GSWA, picked out these folding events, an early isoclinal generation, and then a more upright uh, folding event. The upright folding event is folding the magnetite rich ore zones here. You can see the fold hinge. And it's also had an effect on the specularite veins as well. So it it's, um, constrains the timing of mineralization. And it has Im, uh, importance in terms of mining and exploration. So if you fold a strata bound ore body, then the fold hinges generally de um, define the, the plunge of the ore shoots. And that's what we can see here, long section through the Beban deposit, and the, the, the plunge of these high-grade ore shoots are really characterized by the plunge of these two fold, um, fold generations. But the main question for today, just to remind everyone, is where are these fluids coming from? 
So any suggestions? Here's your chance to participate in the talk. Um, here's the magnetite and carbonate alteration. Crustal fluids. Can anyone suggest likely fluids? Basin. Sorry? Basinal fluids. Basinal fluids, yes. Other? Andreas? Uh, there's not much gold, so orogenic fluids generally are silica rich and they generally will actually, you won't get an um, iron deposit, you get a gold deposit. Yeah, yes, I think it would, it would have to be silica depleted if it's an orogenic fluid. We can discuss this at the end. Metamorphic fluids perhaps, but I would argue that this is metasomatism, we're actually adding materials to it. Uh, magmatic fluids, these are all possibilities. And these are the thoughts that pretty much went through my, my mind before the, uh, I, I resorted to, to lab, lab work. I do, it's, it's my last slide of the talk, essentially. But uh, yeah, jumping the gun a bit, but um, I, I'd prefer to wait until we develop the story a little bit more. And then these ones here may be more in tune with orogenic um, fluids where, yes, we're mobilizing iron, we're also mobilizing silica, so maybe it's more akin to orogenic style. Okay, so this is the, this is the middle part of the talk. So I was, with that, that question in mind, where does the fluid come from, I resorted to Horrock Geochem. So going from this to this, well, I think there might be a volume reduction happening here, so I'm going to use mass balance calculations to compensate for the um, effects of, ma of volume change. This is a very simple diagram for this rock here compared with that rock there, where zero is no change to elemental change to, to, the, uh, to this rock. So obviously there's a big silica decrease, almost 100%. Iron so um, hasn't changed very much, so it's basically volume reduction. Iron has, has stuck around, but stripping out the contaminants we left with the mineral, mineralization. So that's why iron hasn't really changed. And we see a range of other enrichments. Looking at the mafic rocks, I haven't mentioned there, they are commonly altered by hypergene mineralization. We go from the gabbro to a fine-grained uh, iron-rich chlorite rock uh, close to these magnetite ore bodies. Uh, with this, we see um, in depletions, common depletions in calcium, sodium, um, potassium. Basically, we destroy amphiboles and plagioclase, and we strip out calcium, etc. And there's enrichment in iron, increase in loss of ignition, we're forming chlorides. But the so the interesting thing is that if I'm basically there is a chemical exchange between the the BIF and the mafic rocks, so there's a net transference of calcium, potassium, sodium from a rock which is rich in these elements to one which is naturally depleted in, in it. BIF is just iron and silica essentially. So we see the understandable movement of elements from one rock to the other. Same with strontium, rubidium, barium. It's basically shifting from one rock to the other and iron is being contributed to the, to the Mayfield rocks. So this is great. We've actually identified some pathfinders which is fantastic from the point of view of exploration but for my purpose today, it hasn't actually told me about the, the source of the fluid. It's, it's told me a bit about how the, the fluid is working here, but hasn't given me a tracer for the source. So I next considered looking at the chemistry of the iron oxide minerals by laser ablation on magnetite and hematite uh, at Curtin, and I acknowledge the assistance of Noreen and Brad with, uh, with these analyses. This is, for those interested, the, the setup. I just uh, mentioned that I use a relatively large spot size so that I can lower my detection limits. So this is a screenshot essentially of what I zapped. So I was interested in these hydrothermal events. So this is the equivalent of this field of view. So this is my primary uh, iron oxide bands. But in its natural state, the iron probably formed in a hydrostatic mineral at the bottom of the sea floor, it's been buried, undergo diagenesis, maybe some metamorphism to form magnetite. So we have these nice crystalline features here. That's what you see in the Yulgarn. You don't see anything that really predates that episode of, of alteration. So this is my standard. I'm 
I'm comparing hypergene expressions against my metamorphic magnetites, assuming that this hasn't changed in chemistry, in chemistry that much. Looking, avoiding these mineral inclusion rich areas, uh, trying to get large areas and not hitting other um, minerals. At Madunga, the same sort of setup, looking at these bands here, unfortunately, these bands are really quite narrow. These grains are really small. So I had lots of frustrations trying to deal with this data at Madunga. And there's lots of mineral inclusions as well. So that pretty much handcuffed me what I could do with comparing things at Madunga. Hypergene magnetite and the hypergene hematite. So what does the data look like? To cut a long story short, I present two plots here. And I was interested in my least mobile elements, which are compatible with magnetite. So these elements would generally define, have a common ratio. So there may be volume changes in the, in the minerals, but generally their ratio doesn't change. So compare my metamorphic magnetite at Beban with hypergene magnetite at Beban. They define a nice straight line. At Madunga, uh, detection limits are too low for my primary or my metamorphic magnetite, but the hypergene magnetite is here, so a bit weaker at, at Madunga. But I've established my least mobile elements. Now, in terms of hypergene fluids, these ratios haven't changed too much. There's a bit of, dis of scatter in the data, but the ratio hasn't changed, which is understandable. But there's an obvious increase in manganese with the hypergene or at Beban and at Madunga. In addition, there's a, whole, there's a range of other elements which are being enriched, and I'll just show you a couple of plots here. So uh, metamorphic magnetite at Beban, and it's in, the hypergene is enriching copper, copper and lead, and also tungsten, so being dragged towards this area here. So what does that mean? Well, fantastic. Uh, whole rock geochem is nicely matched with the iron oxide. So both show silica depletion in the magnetite-rich ore, or the, um, the hypergene magnetite. And they share common enrichments in, um, in their magnetite. So again, Great for pathfinders. I now can sort of explain the bulk rock geochem in terms of where the signatures are in the iron oxides. But again, it's not giving me definitive traces for uh, fluid source. Fluid inclusions, which is a bit of a barbed sort of uh, study. A lot of people don't like them, but I think here I'm trying to demonstrate that they're actually crucial to my story. So very quickly, I'll just whiz through it. So I've looked at these different alteration stages. Stage one is a siderite replacement. So here is an example. So siderite or throw dolomite surrounded by magnetite. And these inclusions are CO2 rich. So you can just see the, the slightly higher refractive index of this material there. It's a bubble of CO2. I, these are fluid inclusion assemblages. So they formed at the same time. They may have different, in theory, they may have different compositions, but generally they, they form at the same time. And they generally have the same temperature of trapping. So they are very tight sort of uh, temperature constraints. The eutectic temperature is a bit low, so I was a bit worried that there might be some other gases in there. So I quickly ducked over to the, the Raman, and this area here is that fluid inclusion, and characterize the chemistry of this, this little box here. The blue, is that's a spectra. Basically, it's just showing the peaks for ferron dolomite. Fantastic, ferron dolomite. Now, what about here? There's fluorine dolomite, which is the, the matrix, it's a host, but there's the CO2. So very quick way to identify that these are just CO2 rich, no water, uh, fluid inclusions. Now let's have a look at these. This is, remember, dumping out carbonate. There are two stages. There's a, oh, sorry, there are two compositional fluids of the same stage. So there's one which is a three phase. So uh, carbonate, magnetite, mineral inclusions of, of carbonate. This is halite liquid vapor. When I heat this up, halite dissolves, and that gives me my, my minimum trapping temperature. It's fairly hot. Um, if I compare that with other examples of this, this, uh, this sample, I, f I see examples of two phase. So liquid vapor, you say, hang on a sec. There's another thing in there, but this is a solid which I heat up to the maximum, 500 degrees, doesn't change. So it's just an accidentally trapped solid. But 
Nine times out of ten, they're just two-phase inclu inclusions, defining the, the nice growth um, zones of the, the carbonate. And these are slightly lower temperature and lower salinities. So this puzzled me when I, when I started looking at this. But what I think is happening is that this carbonate is alteration is over about four kilometers. So over four kilometers, there is some variation in temperature, maybe proximity to conduits. And there may be some slight variation in salinities as well. So I think that explains why there can be slight differences in, in this uh, stage two fluid. Now skipping along to this carbonate dissolution event. Now this is going to be crucial. What is happening to this fluid to actually go from precipitating carbonate to dissolving it? And to my surprise, the answer is not a lot. Basically, there's just a decrease in temperature. So the temperature range is a bit lower than the fluid which is dumping out the precipitating carbonate. So what I think explains this is that at hot temperatures, solubility of quartz is high. So at hot temperatures, you're efficiently replacing silica with carbonate. As the fluid cools, we have the retrograde solubility of carbonate. So no longer can we efficiently deposit carbonate, we're actually going to dissolve it. So as the fluid gets cooler, we actually have the removal of the carbonate. So quite an efficient process to set, up, set things up and then remove it. And then lastly, quickly, this different event, different fluids is basically quartz and hematite. And depending on the prospect that I'm looking at, there's slight differences in the composition and they're a bit lower temperature. So very different from the carbonate. Don't freak out here. There's a lot of data, but it's very simple. So these are the events, and this is a summary of the, the fluid inclusion information. So the tectic temperatures, which is a proxy for the composition of the fluid. There's the minimum trapping temperature shown here. And there's the salinity for the fluid. So it's quite simple. The early fluid was carbonic. Uh, you say, what? hang on a sec, why is the Trap, the trapping temperature is so low. And it's simply an artifact of me measurement. Monophase fluids uh, have total marginalization at, at room temperature. So the fluid trapping temperature is somewhere up there. So I can't really constrain the, the temperature of this early event. But this event here is fairly hot, but, also, but, but, but starts to cool down. Maybe with time, maybe with space over the four kilometers. But certainly, this stage three, which is shown here, is the lowest temperature of these, these early fluid alteration stages. I sort of blanked out the post-mineralization fluids here. It's not important to the story, um, I think, at the moment. Uh, and then the, the composition of these, all these fluids at Beban are very similar. They're more than NaCl, which should mean that the data would be plotting up here. So there's calcium and iron, magne magnesium, and other components in the, in the fluid. Oh, hang on a sec. I've got to concentrate. Sorry for that. Uh, okay, so the other key thing is that Madunga is quite different. This uh, uh, hematite and quartz event, composition is quite different. Salinities, uh, temperature is fairly low and salinities are quite variable. So that was microthermometry. Phew, we made it through that. Hopefully I haven't lost too many people. The next step was to see the composition of these, these fluids. The microthermometry made some constraints, but now I uh, will go a step further by zapping them. So this is a setup in Leeds. This is about a year ago. I think a year ago, around about today, I was in, in Leeds before Tony was setting up the capability at UWA. So hopefully won't have to travel so far in the future to, to get the same results. So the advantage of this technique is that you can look at in situ one of these fluids, fluid inclusions, ablate it, and collect the data. So there's an example where it's hosted by quartz, and this is a time versus signal and uh, for 16 elements, and the fluid inclusion basically is a big jump in, in chemistry. So this is a characteristic spectrum uh, or spectra for a fluid inclusion. With the carbonate, it was a nightmare. I was frustrated in that I can't see through the composition of the host. So I'm ablating 
the host and also the fluid inclusion. So the host is carbonate, so I, I actually detect the calcium, iron, magnesium, etc. And I can't see the actual signal of the fluid inclusion. Um, you can only see it in the non-matrix elements like uh, potassium and, and sodium. So with those limitations in mind, I just plot this data here. So just let your eyes drift, unfocus a little bit, just to see the main um, feature, which is the fact that we have uh, a relative decrease in this list of, of elements included here. You can read that. But these elements weren't chosen at random. I had a maximum list of about 16 that the mass spec could, could handle. And I tried to pull out elements where signatures of felsic magmas, maybe uh, mafic rocks, brines, etc. So that was the explanation for these elements and basically low values for say the, the felsic magmatic fluids, um, may, may basically the, the cations which are the, the usual culprits are expressed in, in these fluids from the different stages. Again, one of the more, the more complicated diagrams, but don't stress too much, I'm just showing the different elements, potassium, calcium, magnesium, etc., and I show the different stages of, alterate, of fluid alteration here. And so the Beban fluids, the magnetite ore, are most dissimilar to, to Madunga speculite ore. So compare this data with this data here for potassium, do the same with these, these other elements. And you'll see that generally the specularite ore has a different chemistry to the magnetite rich ore. By comparing the mineralized magnetite fluid, rich fluid, with the unmineralized, basically only iron and manganese, with the ore fluid containing more iron and manganese. So not, not very helpful. I actually thought I'd get a little bit more out of uh, the laser ablation on the fluid inclusions. If I compare it with literature data, so this is data extracted from Yardley and Bodna, uh, perspectives in Geochem, and plotted as these fields here and these, these dashed lines, I plot my data in these circles. And interestingly, these earlier fluids plot within the magmatic field. So this orange is magmatic fluids, the black is black smoker. Uh, the Madunga magnetite veins, these grey uh, circles, plot within geothermal brines. So that's interesting. So maybe these magnetite rich ores ha do have a, a felsic fluid um, component. And then these post mineralization samples and, uh, are generally saying does not include a, a magmatic fluid component. So that was actually um, quite a reasonable outcome of traveling across the world to, uh, to, get, to get that data. Very briefly, iron chromatography. Basically, instead of in situ, it's using mineral separates. You crush it, dissolve the contents, and then you, you analyze it. It's for these components. And so, yes, confirmed sodium and, and potassium, I knew that already. But the interesting thing is the, the halogens. So the, the cool thing about the halogens is that they are basically traces for the fluids. So the silica-rich rocks that the fluids pass through don't contain a lot of chlorine or bromine, unless it's got evaporites. So that means that the fluids pretty much hang on to their trace um, chemistry. So these are quite, quite useful. So I could show you a dozen plots, but here's one of them. And chlorine bromine ratio versus sodium bromine. The important thing is that these earlier fluids, the red is the stage two, it falls within the magmatic fields for literature values and also this literature uh, value field here in the, the orange, whereas all these other stage fluids are, uh, are off the magmatic trend. So I won't describe this in, in any greater detail. It's not crucial for the story today. Another attempt was carbon oxygen isotopes. So basically, I'm, I'm, I was having a fair crack at the, uh, the issue. I thought none of these techniques was a slam dunk. None of it was, was so definitive. I think it's building the, the story, building the evidence. So carbon isotopes are actually quite useful. Sending the separates off to, to Canada, um, at the same, for the analysis on the carbonates, at the same time, I looked at the oxygen isotopes for the quartz at, uh, at UWA, through, uh, which is in situ. So building these two data sets together, uh, reporting it in the standard conventions as mineral data, but then calculating their fluid values. How do I do that? Well, I use my microthermometry constraints. 
and a complicated diagram again, but I'll, I'll walk our way through it. So these are the, the samples that I was analyzing. Just focus your attention on this box here, which is, pair, which is paired isotopic data. So comparing carbon isotopes with oxygen isotopes for my carbonates. On this standard plot, you generally see literature fields for, for typical fluids. So draw your attention to magmatic fluids, mantle uh, fluid ranges, and metamorphic fluids and my data in these, these box, block, uh, boxes here. So the earliest stage of this, these CO2 rich fluids, pretty much smack bang in the, within the, the magmatic fluid. So that was encouraging, supporting other lines of, of, uh, of evidence that there's a magmatic component. Uh, whereas the later fluids generally are more in the negative range of, oxy of oxygen values whilst maintaining perhaps to a large extent, their uh, original signature of carbon isotopes. Uh, if I go up the diagram, this is the in situ oxygen isotope data, and I'll just probably show the location of, uh, let's see, the post mineralization fluids at Beban, again in the negative range, and the specularite fluids uh, at Madunga in the negative range. So. To cut a long story short, the, these magnetite fluid events are basically recording the magmatic signature with buffering from Archean seawater, whereas the post mineralization stages and the specularite is basically Archean seawater, perhaps with meteoric waters involvement. And then recently, uh, well, no, not so recently, had a, uh, an attempt to constrain these fluids in terms of time. Uh, in 2012, basically, if you've got a something that you don't want to do, you recruit a, a master student. I think Eric knows all about that, as we all do. So Thomas Anger and I, we had our samples, and we recruited uh, hardworking South Korean uh, Jim Woo, and basically his task was to find us some datable minerals, hydrothermal minerals. To our surprise, he came back with a swagful. There, it was actually very abundant monazites and xenotine. Uh, Jim Wu imaged them with the SEM and did point analysis with the microprobe, established that these monazites uh, in particular were quite homogeneous. Fantastic for, for considering dating. They're rather small and they contain very low uranium, which is a bit of a bummer because uh, you don't have the uranium lead age capabilities. Maybe thorium lead age might be more in tune. Uh, so I broke these thin sections to make a mount. I unhappily destroyed all my examples of the Beban monazite samples. It was a bad morning that day. And so what I could salvage was the examples from the Dunga. Here's, here's an example of monazite, which is integral with hypergene talc and hypergene magnetite in a vein. And a bit surprisingly, I got these point analysis ages. Fairly large error. And these basically are individual monazite grains. So they're, they're quite, they're, they're different. So I think the best way to, ex, to interpret this is that they're, the events are Archean in age and that there are multiple hydrothermal events being recorded by this, this sample. Now this is what I did a few weeks ago. And this is actually quite challenging to pull out all of the compilation of the published ages for World Range because everyone's had a crack at, at World Range it seems. Uh, the data is sourced from GeoView, and basically I'm just presenting published ages here, and then these are my ages and Martin Van Cronodont's constraints on deformation events. So what you can see from this is that the foot wall rocks to the BIF are nicely constrained. They're very old. The hanging wall rocks to BIF are a lot younger. This is about a 200 million year interval. And the BIF, the timing of the BIF deposition is actually quite poorly constrained. The best constraints are a classic rock which is interlayered with the BIF. So that's a broad timing constraint with the, uh, the age of BIF deposition. The Nanagurugu igneous, com igneous complex is interpreted to intrude the foot wall rocks and to inflate the BIF macro bands. So the age of this should be older the BIF deposition. So they're roughly about the same, same age. Now what's interesting is if you look at the felsic igneous rocks, and remember I'm sort of 
proposing felsic fluids has been crucial in this alteration story. If you look at their distribution in world range, the first dated magnetite enrichment and vent corresponds with this magnetic interval, the second one with I guess loosely with this one, and then there's a couple of younger events which I haven't put on this diagram. So this is circumstantial evidence that at least at the timing of mineralization, if it, if it is uh, constrained, is broadly coincident with felsic magnetism and at least Martin van Cronodont's deformation um, events. And these deformation events hang to, together in that these magnetite all bodies are folded by the ones that are mapped in the, in the field. So I think there's quite a nice story there. Relating it spatially, this is just a temporal relationships. I'm looking for felsic intrusions which actually occur close to the BIF. Well, actually, there's a lot of felsic intrusions in the area, but at the very start of the talk, I said, uh, don't consider this large body here because it's this. This is color coordinated with the map. This is after mineralization and after greenstone formation, so it just eats its way into the, the greenstone belts. But what's more interesting is this colored felsic intrusions here, which are these ones here. So they occur within 15 kilometers in plan view. And now let's look in section. So I think I must uh, have pulled rank or know some people high up because I've got a, a seismic line going through world range, which is hard to believe. Uh, but it's, uh, it starts in the Naria terrain, goes through World Range and continues for uh, kilometers to the, to the east. So in, this is Tim Ivanik's uh, interpretation, World Range Greenstone Belt is located here and here are some, here are the outcrop expressions. So this felsic intrusions equate with these, this one here is with that. So at, at least even at, 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 uh, at surface, they're within 15 k's. Uh, at depth, this interval is unknown, but uh, through discussion with Tim Ivanik, he mentions that the specific gravity of this unit here is consistent with felsic intrusion. Uh, poorly constrained, don't know, that, um, I guess it's, it's uh, timing or composition, but it's very, it's very close to the greenstone belt. So there's many culprits possible contributing to these fluids. Phew, so that's all, all the data. I'm going to wrap things up now. And I gave this talk yesterday and these are pretty much the expressions of my team members in the work group. Maybe the last person would be someone quietly dozing in the, in the corner. But uh, um, hopefully everyone's sort of here with me at this stage. So the synthesis. So basically, this is a setup at Beaven deposit. Over about eight kilometers, there's a deposit, there's the carbonate alteration halo. So let's just flip it on its side and imagine what it was like before folding and tilting. It would have been horizontal sort of setup. So let's just imagine that at the time of mineralization, it was sub-horizontal. Ta-da, that's, that's, uh, that's how I've done it. So in this sort of setup, uh, the first stage of alteration is a stage one fluid. CO2 rich, silica depleted, a reduced fluid to form the magnetite. It's been very efficient at aggressively replacing the original silica with, with uh, the siderite. Through many lines of evidence, I believe it's, it's derived from magmatic fluid source. Very little input of, of water. These are CO2 rich, not carbonic aqueous fluid inclusions. Don't know the temperature that, that occurred. Uh, this was then superseded Oh, um, not superseded, but uh, it was followed by this stage of carbonate alteration where it's fairly hot and we're still removing what silica is left. So we're precipitating a vast amount of ferron dolomite. Fairly hot temperature with variable salinities. The lines of evidence show that there's most likely a magmatic component, but we're starting to get the, the influence of seawater. Still hot, so heated seawater going through here. I put this as a conduit here. When I was mapping the field, I was very frustrated. I was looking for obvious cross-cutting structures, cutting the, uh, the range. But the stratigraphy is all transposed, so everything's all parallel. And so I went from leaseholder BIF straight into mineralized BIF. So I put this conduit here because this is where the guts of the ore body is. This is where all of these fluids have been localized, one on top of the other. 
whereas this area here is most likely distal to a, a conduit. And then importantly, um, as the, the fluids, the source of heat uh, wound down, we start to have the overprinting, the dissolution of the carbonate, uh, the formation of uh, residual magnetite, rich ore, resulting in our high-grade ore body. So perhaps a, a cooling vent location where there's becoming more involvement of Archean seawater with, with time. And we've had the, the chemical exchange of the, the surrounding rocks with the, the BIF leaving their, their geochem geochemical footprint. So I think um, in terms of analogues, I, I, I quite like the idea that maybe we're dealing with a hydrothermal convection cell driven by magmatic um, source of at least heat, probably fluids as well something similar to what we see in modern day black smoker environments and also preserved in our, our greenstone belts. Something really interesting here at Gosson Hill, which is also, I think it's okay, within a few hundred kilometers, is that we precipitate massive pyrite, but also intimately uh, precipitate magnetite veins. So I think this proves that this type of scenario is, is feasible. So arm waving a little bit in terms of tectonics. Basically, I think we need a, a source, a driver of, of heat. Um, at about this time, this is an isotopic map put together by David Moll a few years ago, showing crash on boundaries, uh, between paleo crash on boundaries. So just look at this area, world range is, is here. Uh, I think Tim Ivanik and, and other people at the Geological Survey have sort of looked at this area as something dissimilar from surrounding areas. Uh, and suggesting that maybe crustal extension, um, perhaps being sympathetic with the, the formation of, of, of magmas. So maybe during this broad interval, maybe it's the perfect environment to, to lay down the BIF, and then uh, after a period of time, um, uh, create some sort of fluid movement to form the, the ore bodies. And so if you look at where do we get these extensional areas in a VMS um, way of thinking, well maybe, yeah, so you can get it in mid-ocean ridge areas but also in continental uh, rift environments, maybe something like what Tim has and others have mentioned in the World Range area. And then not to forget the, the poorly mineralized event, very different fluids compared with the, the magnetite. These post-date magnetite and folding and they're pretty much just shear zone controlled. I think they are pretty much in tune with orogenic fluids or uh, in, in that they are dumping out iron and uh, remobilizing, or remobilizing iron and, and silica. And low temperatures, uh, uh, near surface environment, maybe a sniff of seawater but meteoric waters. Perhaps it's something equivalent to what people have been documenting throughout the Yulgarn these late basin environments like in the Agni Luna Belt where we deposit classic rocks conglomerates, maybe in that sort of environment we have fluids being able to circulate. Uh, and you don't need too, too hot to temperatures to get mobilization of, of iron. So the conclusion is basically have I addressed this main question, what was it? It was what is the, what type of fluids are responsible for hypergene alteration of BIF uh, and the, in these, uh, these ores? And the main result is that alteration was progressive. I think it's quite an elo eloquent sort of um, model for alteration, sequential alteration. If one of these stages is not there, you're not going to form the high-grade ore deposit at the end of it. Um, with a significant component of magmatic fluids, transitioning to more involvement of uh, cooler seawater fluids. The specularite quartz veins are brine, but tapping seawater and meteoric fluids, and they are not that important in terms of uh, mineralization within these types of deposits. Um, arguably, Kulinobi might be a little bit different, but at least at world range, it's not that uh, important. And then let's just squeeze in uh, supergene alteration in the very few last minute of the talk. Basically, I think these hypergene events are crucial. Not only have we upgraded the BIF in terms of iron, but we've set the scenes texturally and compositionally for the later up, further upgrade by the supergene fluids. It's a lot easier to remove carbonate than it is to remove uh, uh, quartz in a 
otherwise unaltered BIF. So if we were to look at the distributions of these deposits in the yield garden, you do see these evidence for the hypergene alteration throughout these known de deposits. So last slide, implications are that um, through looking, finding, trying to work out the, the source of the fluids, I've identified pathfinders, geochemical pathfinders for high-grade ore. Uh, there's a potential not only spatial but genetic link between these magnetite rich ore zones and VMS. So if we're exploring within a, a greenstone belt, if we find evidence for one, maybe there's evidence for the, um, the occurrence of the other in that greenstone belt. So I think that's quite important. And then these Yulgarn examples, yes, they're small deposits. Um, they are economical, they have been mined but they easily translate to our understanding of the giant ore deposits in Western Australia and Brazil. And I say that on the basis of published work. Warren Thorne has published uh, at Mount Tom Price and Rosa um, Silva published in Carajas. And without going into the long st uh, history of it, Carajas is a felsic magma a fluid component, whereas in the Hammersley it's basinal brines pumping through the, the BIF. Sure, I think that's about enough. Thanks.